Welcome to Physics Can Be Fun with me, Stephen Thomas. Today I'd like to talk about how they use Doppler effect to help find flight MH370, a Malaysian Boeing 777 flight, which seemed to just disappear. And now they are beginning to find debris in the area that science seemed to contribute to help finding using the Doppler effect. Now what had happened is this flight had taken off from Malaysia and then it had turned off its transponder in every way that people knew of tracking it. And then it just disappeared, creating one of the greatest mysteries of, modern, of the modern uh, era. And for weeks now we haven't been able to find this plane until some satellite people helped think of some way that they could help track this plane. So let's just quickly draw this plane and show you what they did. So if this is our plane, here's our Boeing 777 flight MH370. What they found was that even though everything had been switched off there was, I believe it's in the wing, something that sends out a ping every hour to a satellite. So here's the satellite. Let's give it some solar panels. And this ping was of a certain frequency. And every hour for five hours this plane pinged. And after that there were no more pings so they could assume the plane had crashed. So it had no electronics to send out the ping anymore. Now what we, the scientists, know is that this ping is an electromagnetic wave. It's a magnetic wave and these waves all travel at the speed of light, which is abbreviated C. And the C has a certain speed or velocity of 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. So that's the SI units. 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. So they knew the speed at which the signal was sent to the satellite. And these people were able to time how long the signal traveling at the speed of, of light took. So they knew delta T, they knew the speed of light, and then they use the formula C equals distance or delta x over delta t. So because they knew C, which was equal to 3 times 10 to the 8, cross multiplying times, let's say the signal took 1 second. Let's say delta t was 1. Delta x would therefore be equal to Let's say it was one second, it would be 3 times 10 to the 8, and this would be the distance, and it would be in meters. So now, from just measuring the time that it took for the signal to get to the satellite, knowing it traveled at the speed of light, they could therefore figure out delta x, or the distance of the plane from the satellite. But that distance, if this is a center of a circle, that plane could be anywhere on the circumference of this circle where the satellite is the center. So that is where we get an arc to the north, which goes to China, and an arc to the south, which goes past the west coast of Australia. So let's suppose there's Australia. They could figure out that this plane was either flying north to China or south to the South Pole. So now they needed another piece of information. Was the plane flying north or south? And apparently this satellite is sitting on the equator that's in the north. So, how does the Doppler effect work? Well, let's just briefly explain to you how Doppler works and then you'll quickly get this. If you take this plane pinging, what you find happen is that if something is standing still and every time it pings, it sends out a pulse. 
and your pulses tend to create what look like ripples in a pond and all the ripples are equal distances apart. But if this thing creating the ripples is moving in a certain direction, what you find is that after it's created one ripple in the circle, it now moves closer to the ripple it last created when it creates its next ripple. And so you tend to get what looks like circles that look like this squashed on the one side, and this is the direction of motion, squashed together and spread apart. So do you see that? This is what we call the Doppler effect, that on this side, the ripples are close together, so we say that their wavelength, the distance between the ripples, the wavelength, is it smaller or greater? The wavelength is smaller, but on this side, the wavelength, abbreviated lambda, is, that side it's larger, this side it is smaller, there is your wavelength. But, look at this formula here. You need to know this, that, that C is equal to frequency times wavelength. Now C is a constant, equals frequency times wavelength. If we divide both sides by wavelength, wavelength cancels with wavelength, and we're left with wavelength on the left. So in other words, we're left with a formula that frequency and wavelength are inversely related. The bigger this one, the smaller that one. The bigger that one, the smaller that one. So using simply the formula that C equals frequency times wavelength, we see that the relationship between these two is inverse. So you can see that as the wavelength gets bigger, the frequency gets smaller. As the wavelength gets smaller, the frequency gets larger. So here, the frequency is going to be getting bigger as the wavelength gets smaller. And here, the frequency is going to get smaller on the side where, away from the direction of motion. Okay, now how did they use that? Well, if this satellite's in the north, if the plane is flying south, then the Doppler pattern will look like this, that the pings will be spread out. The wavelength will be spread out. The frequency will therefore become less. As the wavelength gets bigger, the frequency gets less. And if, however, the plane is flying north, then the frequency is going to be greater and the wavelength smaller. So this is what they did. They listened to the pings, the actual frequency of the ping which they knew. And they could see that the ping's frequency was lower. And the wavelength was longer. The frequency was lower. There were less pings per second. So therefore they could conclude from this that the plane was flying in the southern part of this arc past the west coast of Australia. Do you see that? So now they could say Simply because the frequency was decreased, and that's the Doppler effect, if something is moving away from the source, say away from the source, then the frequency is lower, and if it's moving towards the source, the frequency is higher. And so they could, they'd now determined that the plane was flying somewhere on this arc. And because they knew the speed of the plane approximately, the speed of the plane was given at um, 450 knots or 232 meters per second. That's approximately what the plane is flying. And then it flew for five hours. They could more or less tell where it was going to end up. So it was on the arc, flying towards the south, and they could figure out where it was going to end up. And then even more cleverly, they used this Doppler formula. And that says that if you have the frequency of the listener, which is the satellite frequency of the listener equals the speed of light over the speed of light plus minus the velocity of the listener. Now the velocity of the listener is the 
velocity of the satellite in space. They know that. And let's suppose it was stationary and it was zero. A geostationary satellite, then maybe that's zero, but I doubt it. But let's say so. They know C, they know that, they know C, and now they can work out the velocity of the source of the ping, which is the plane. And this is the velocity relative to the satellite. So in a straight line with the satellite, was it moving away from the satellite or towards the satellite? That's the velocity we talk about. Not, it's actual, not the actual velocity of the plane relative to the Earth or the air, but the velocity of the plane relative to the source, uh, relative to the satellite. And so they were then able, knowing the frequency of the listener, which they could measure, they knew the frequency of the source, which was the ping on the plane, they could work out the velocity of the actual plane relative to the satellite. And using that too, they could help pinpoint the, the more or less within 100 miles or 100 kilometers, they could pinpoint more or less where the last ping had occurred. And so this is how they used the Doppler effect, the Doppler equation, the equation for the speed of light is distance over time, and they used all this rather old science in a very new and exciting way. And this is what science is for, to alleviate suffering. Those poor Chinese and Malaysian relatives had been grieving for a long time, having no clue what happened to this plane, and science, some innovative people, came, and these were the people from England, Inmarsat, who the scientists who helped to put this all together and help solve the mystery somewhat of where this plane was heading when it disappeared. And this is going to help greatly with the search effort, which is still ongoing. And when the weather improves in the next few days, they're going to hopefully find the, the pieces of the, the plane and and at least put an end to the, to the mystery of this and help the relatives. So that is the purpose of science, to be used for good and creative ways. So science is an ongoing uh, process, and if you become a scientist, there's no limit to the, the uses which science can be put to.